Will Europe's populists finally make a breakthrough? Mainstream politicians face a challenge from the far right as 400 million Europeans vote in this week's EU Parliament elections. How will voting shape the future of the continent? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Inside Story from London. I'm Barbara Serra. The world's second largest democratic election starts on Thursday. Voters in 28 countries will choose 751 members of the EU Parliament. Immigration and the economy are dominating the political agenda and the rise of the far right is dominating the headlines. Mainstream politicians are calling for a united Europe, urging voters to reject right-wing and populist candidates. Far-right leaders, meanwhile, from nearly a dozen countries, including France, Germany and the Netherlands, were in Italy on Saturday in a show of unity. The rally in Milan was led by Italy's Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini, who wants to form a powerful far-right bloc within the EU Parliament. Some analysts are saying the future of the European Union is at stake. We'll talk to our guests in just a moment. First, though, this report from Osama bin Javaid in Milan. Matteo Salvini, Italy's deputy prime minister and interior minister, is hoping to upset the status quo during this European Union elections. He plans to do it with the help of Eurosceptics, whose anti-immigrant and nationalist slogans are pulling crowds in ailing economies. We need to do everything that is right to free this country, this continent, from the illegal occupation organized by Brussels. Instead of traditional billboards and TV ads, social media has been instrumental in getting the League's message across and making inroads into traditional left-leaning cities such as Milan. And it found an audience in the richer parts of northern Italy, where some relate to slogans such as why should we pay for others who don't contribute as much. Alessandro Morelli has been with Salvini since the beginning. He blames a divided EU for Italy's woes. France decided to start a military operation against Libya, which caused very serious damage not only in Italy, but also in Europe. Europe today is totally divided and only exists for the interests of France and Germany. Many Italians disagree with the populists, and they have been protesting with thousands of homemade banners. The movement grew after the government forcibly removed slogans from a balcony by using firefighters. To Salvini's opponents, this was one more manifestation of authoritarianism and fascism, which they say is being peddled by the League Party. I think uh, that this kind of politics, uh, this hatred, this uh, being against everything, uh, is beginning uh, to make people feel sick. This election has become more interesting than previous ones. Besides UK's Brexit failure, there's also a surge of populists across Europe. Among them is Italy's Matteo Salvini, whose populist policies about immigration and economy has found him allies from Germany to Hungary. And this new alliance wants to overhaul the European Union. Alessandro Madron wrote a book about the rise of Salvini in 2015. He fears that a strong right-wing alliance in the long run could mean the end of the European dream. European politics have been too far from people and too close to finance. Europe was not able to give real answers, as it put too many limits on everything. And there are many parts of the European population who felt the burden of the European Union without feeling the advantages. The European Parliament consists of 751 MEPs, representing more than 500 million people from 28 countries. The big question is, how many of them will give their backing to Salvini's new alliance of far-right European leaders? Osama bin Javed al Jazeera, Milan. Well, let's now introduce our guests, Theophanis Exadactylos, Senior Lecturer in European Politics at the University of Surrey, Anand Menon, Director of the UK in a Changing Europe Initiative, and a former Special Advisor to the House of Lords EU Committee. And joining us from Milan, Stefano Vergine, an Italian journalist who focuses on economics and foreign affairs, 
and is also co-author of The Black Book of the Lega. Gentlemen, uh, welcome all of you to Inside Story. Theofanis Exelos, if I can start with you, we've mm -hmm. just seen this report about that rally in Milan led by Matteo Salvini. How likely do you think it is that a lot of these far-right stroke populist parties across Europe will be able to form a, a functioning coalition, a functioning bloc within the European Parliament? This is the most important question because this is the first time that we've seen these parties cooperating together. Uh, usually they don't like each other, uh, they don't like to be associated with each other. Uh, Right-wing nationalism has different shades. And for a lot of these parties across Europe, they have tried over time to create a more mainstream image about themselves to be able to attract more um, you know, mainstream voters rather than the extremes. So they have traditionally, they traditionally didn't like to to cooperate with each other. But this time, I think they're trying to, to put together something that's more transnational in order to be able to tackle the issue of Europe. Uh, all of them have anti-European uh, feelings and sentiments and, and, and public discourses, so that helps them. But at the end of the day, how much they will be able to sustain this kind of alliance going forward inside the European Parliament will remain to be seen. And Menon, what do you think? Do you think there's more that unites them than divides them? Uh, there are obviously things that unite them. They have common attitudes towards, in particular, the centrist political elite. I mean, across Europe now, you're getting this rhetoric about mainstream politics being broken. But, of course, the fundamental paradox of these parties is that nationalist parties struggle to work transnationally. It's almost inherent in their DNA that, you know, they will fight. And if you take an issue like, for instance, immigration, on the one hand, yes, they want lower immigration. On the other hand, they fight amongst themselves because the right in Italy, one of their bugbears is... Other countries in the European Union aren't taking enough of these people that come to Europe. And, of course, that's something that they squabble amongst themselves about. Mm -hmm. uh, Stefano Vergine joining us from Milan, where, of course, that meeting uh, to play, took place, led by Matteo Salvini, who is not only the head of the Lega, but obviously the deputy prime minister in, in Italy. And it does look like his party will have the majority. I mean, how was he selling it, this, this union of far-right parties? Uh, well, um, Salvini is, is, is saying that these elections are very important for Lega and for the European Union. And he's trying to gather together all the European far-right parties um, in order to change the European Union. That's what, he's, what he usually says. Um, I agree with Mr. Manion. Uh, when it comes to, to, to uh, propose how to change it, um, the parties, these, these far-right parties, are very diverse uh, among each other. For example, um, Lega and Salvini himself is trying to to, to push uh, public spending in Italy, um, so the public debt will will increase. And uh, last year they they drafted a bill law which, which was expansionary, um, and Lega was criticized by AFD, which is its German ally now at the European elections. Um, and, of course, uh, back to the studio, Theophanes Exadactylos, mm -hmm. uh, to you. I mean, the timing wasn't great for Matteo Salvini in that meeting That's because true. on that very day, uh, we saw the eventual resignation of the vice-chancellor in Austria, Austria, who was a member of a far-right party, mm -hmm. part of a coalition, uh, because of this video sting that released, uh, that was shown, effectively showing him offering government mm -hmm. contracts to a supposed Russian oligarch's mm -hmm. uh, niece. How damn, obviously, I mean, damaging potentially maybe in Austria, but beyond that, do you think people across Europe will look at that and think, actually, we can't trust these far-right mm -hmm. parties when they get into government? Well, they, they, there have been um, equivalent reports for other parties around Europe. Uh, classic example is the Golden Dawn. Its members have been accused of murder, participating in gangs, uh, prosecuting uh, immigrants and so on on the streets. Uh, they have gone to jail and still the support uh, remains. So we have to consider how much of an effect uh, a leader has in, in driving support for the party and how much the ideology of the party has infiltrated certain segments of the voters uh, in order to convince them to stay on despite all these allegations. So we need to, 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 to see how, um, how damaging it will be for uh, the FPÖ in Austria. Uh, but I don't think it will be that damaging for all the parties across Europe. 
Anna and uh, Menon, do you agree with that? Do you think that stuff like that actually has an impact on voters in other countries? It has an impact, but on the particular issue of links with Russia and with Vladimir Putin, it depends on the country. Because, mm. of course, in, in Italy, this is very mainstream, Berlusconi yeah. was a great friend of Putin and it didn't harm him. Uh, in France, you saw the scandal over the Front National with bank loans from Russians. And again, that didn't seem to resonate. So. On the one hand, the opponents of these parties say they're dangerous, they're teaming up with our enemy, but it doesn't seem to get that much resonance amongst public opinion, and certainly not amongst supporters of these parties. It doesn't seem to make much cut through. Mm. Uh, Stefano, uh, that leads me to you, because, of course, one of the issues in your book, uh, the black book of the Lega, was very much about potential financial links between Russia and the, the Lega. First of all, explain to us what you said uh, in your book and also what reaction there was to it in Italy when it was published, which was only a few months ago. Yeah, well, um, we revealed in the book that there was a negotiation ongoing at least from July 2018 until October 2018 to fund Lega with the Russian money. Uh, when I say Russian money, the negotiation that we have uh, evidence of was between uh, an oil, state-owned oil owned company by, by Russian state, Rasneft, and the Italian state oil company, which is any e and I. Um, so we witnessed a meeting uh, at the Metropole Hotel in Moscow on October 18, 2018, where there was a Salvini's representative whose name is Gianluca Savoini um, and some intermediaries from, from the Russian, uh, from, from, from Russia, people that are deemed to be strictly linked with the with Putin's inner circle. Um, so basically, they were talking about selling, Rosneft selling 3 million tons of diesel to any via an intermediary bank from the European Union. Um, on, this, on this amount of diesel, uh, they were discussing about having a 4% discount, but in the end, it was not any benefiting from the discount, but Lega. This is what the people were saying, and one of Salvini representatives for Russia was, was there. We didn't get any reply from them, um, and there wasn't much coverage of the issue in Italy. Uh, and, and since uh, the publication of the book, I mean, we really have seen the Lega surge uh, in the opinion polls that we think, you know, they could almost double what they had uh, in the previous elections at these EU elections. In Italy specifically, what do you think is behind the Lega's success? And then I'll ask all of our uh, guests, uh, you know, why they think populism is surging. But starting with you, Stefano. Well, it's mainly the migrant issue that is, that is something... Um, very, very big for, for Italians at the moment um, because of the flow of migrants that, uh, that arrived in Italy over the last years. And this is, this is what Salvini is always stressing. So he's always focusing his speeches on the migrant issue by saying, I'm the one who is going to solve it. Uh, in fact, the number of arrivals have decreased uh, dramatically, I would say, over the last two years. Um, however, the percentage of people that um, are going missing or are dying on the journey to Italy in the Mediterranean Sea, these percentages is an increase. Anand Menon, looking at populism across Europe, is immigration really the main issue, do you think? Immigration is one of the main issues, yes. I mean, we've got to bear in mind that it's a different immigration issue in different states. So if you take Britain, what distinguishes us was a very, very sort of focused debate on EU citizens coming to the United Kingdom prior to our referendum. And that's totally different to any other member state where the debate was about people coming from outside Europe into Europe. But, of course, the other common theme, I think, is a sort of anti-politics, this notion that we hear from the Brexit party in this country that mainstream politics is broken. And that's one of the reasons why we have populism rising, not just on the right, but also on the left, with radical green and radical left-wing movements as well set to do well in these elections. There's a growing sense, I think, partly because of immigration, partly because of the continuing after-effects of the financial crisis and wage stagnation across Europe, that politics is somehow broken and we need to have something new to fix it. Uh, Theophanes Exodactylos, obviously, in the Eurozone, yeah. there was also a terrible crisis, mm -hmm. which for many countries is still ongoing. Does that go hand-in-hand hand with the immigration issue? Of course. Austerity and immigration are, are the two key drivers, especially in the south of Europe. 
um, and uh, the fact that it was too much of German um, manipulation of the bailouts, uh, too much involvement in domestic politics. Um, so um, there is a sense that the previous political elites who have agreed those bailout agreements, who have agreed to austerity measures, have failed what the people really need. And this is one of the classic um, uh, discourses that uh, populist parties uh, use, a kind of divide between the previous corrupt elites and the pure people. And this is the kind of, of issue that we see being reproduced over and over uh, in, in, in political rallies uh, from these parties. And I would agree with Anand there that it's, it's coming both from the left and from the right. But who latches on to which particular discourse depends on, on, on where they're situated, so in which country. So, for example, in Greece, the left-wing message has been much more popular than the right-wing message. In Italy, this has not been the case. So, um, the mainstream parties have failed to capitalize on the concerns of, of, of the people and present the alternative discourses that, that can, can, can potentially protect um, uh, liberal democracies from uh, the surge of the far right. And uh, Anand Menon, focusing on Brexit, of course, it does seem a bit absurd that nearly three years after this country mm -hmm. voted to leave the EU, here we are holding uh, European elections. I mean, when we hear a lot of the topics, mm -hmm. uh, immigration, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the economy, the UK not part of the Eurozone, but certainly enormous inequality that we see is only mm -hmm. growing here. How would you differentiate, or perhaps you think they're similar, uh, the populist movements that we have seen in Europe uh, with the Brexit phenomenon that we've seen here, which, of course, almost predates all of the big surges in Europe? Well, firstly, what I'd say is this is the only country where those anti-European forces have significant support for leaving the European Union. What you see across populist movements in the rest of the EU is this remain and reform type approach of Salvini, reform from within. It's only in this he country... He used to want to leave. No, yeah. no, absolutely, and that's changed, and it changed very notably in France as well, where Marine Le Pen changed her message during the presidential campaign because that issue of leaving didn't give her the resonance she wanted. And I think one of the reasons is because Brexit has proven so difficult. If you're a citizen of France or of Italy, you're watching what's happening in Britain and you're thinking, if we try to leave, not only will we have that, but we need to get a new currency as well, the difficulties of leaving have, have become very, very clear, I think. So, in that sense, we're slightly different to the other member states because the desire to leave was a lot stronger, I think, uh, amongst the British people than it is amongst people in other member states. So, Stefano Vergine, what impact do you think the Brexit debate and the fact that the UK, as we've been hearing, still hasn't really managed to leave, what impact has that had on the electorate in Italy? Do they really talk about it? Does Lega, for example, use it as, you know, as an example of a country to lead, to follow? Uh, well, the short answer is no, uh, in the sense that um, Brexit from the, from the media is, and from the politicians is deemed to be a separate issue. Uh, from the European U Union issue. Um, so the debate here is more about um, the migrant issue, as I was mentioning before, and on um, the budget and the fact that Italy should spend more public money in order to boost the economy, whereas the European Union, as they say, the elites in Brussels um, are more strict and don't want us to spend money and, and, and our economy to grow. This is, this is mainly what, what uh, the League and the Five Star Movement are saying. Uh, Stefano, before we spoke about, you know, potential uh, Russian links with the Lega, um, Steve Bannon as well, Trump's former chief strategist, uh, has made no secret that he wants to support a Salvini-led uh, union. Does that have an impact in a country like Italy? Um, well, it has an impact, uh, not so much because of Bannon, which is not very known among the people, ordinary people in Italy, but it did have an impact on Salvini, I think, because as we revealed in the book, uh, the first meeting between Salvini and Bannon took place on April 2016 in Washington, D.C., uh, when, when uh, Bannon explicitly uh, suggested Salvini to attack Pope Francis, uh, and in fact, this is what happened right after with Salvini uh, tweeting against the Pope uh, for the migrant issue um, and um, wearing, for example, a T-shirt during a, a Lagos rally of Benedict, so the, the Pope Francis' predecessor. Um, this led to an alliance, according to what we what we 
what we could mm, reveal between uh, Bannon and, and part of the US and also uh, mm, with um, parts of the cardinals that um, are within the Vatican and oppose um, Pope Francis and his politics. Um, Anand and Theophan is here in the studio. I mean, Steve Bannon has always said, you know, he wants the end of mainstream politics to change uh, the system. Just regarding him, or really the demise, perhaps, or certainly the change of mainstream politics, uh, Theophan, uh, first to you. How, we, I mean, is that what we're seeing across Europe, do you think? Well, I think we're seeing a new version of politics, not the end of politics, uh, as we know it. But it's, it is a new version, and we have to understand how that operates. And um, populist parties are very good at reinventing themselves, at capturing the spirit of the times, so to speak, whereas more mainstream parties are more rigid in their structures and the way that they uh, approach people. So I think there needs to be a different tactic that mainstream parties can follow in order to be able to, um, to, to counter uh, the surge. But it's interesting that you mentioned Steve Bannon because um, what effectively that kind of support manages to do is to organize the, the, the right-wing populist parties better um, and, and provide external uh, support, additional visibility and so on. So um, there is a different way of, of, of doing things uh, in politics, which seems to be a little bit more under the table rather than more transparent. Um, and it's interesting because um, uh, right-wing parties have the capacity to mobilize supporters. Mainstream parties don't have that capacity. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely those active messages that Steve Bannon used to bring Trump forward that have an, an additional effect uh, in the European context. Uh, and then we mentioned that the rigidity of some parties and how mm -hmm. it could be working against them. I mean, the Conservative Party might be a case in point. We're seeing the various fringes. It's just very difficult to contain it in one party. Is that when we think of changes to mainstream politics, perhaps the end of the big umbrella party and more smaller coalition go governments? Well, maybe. I mean, I think we need to just be a bit cautious here because ultimately in countries like this or in France or in Germany, you have a populist challenge, but they're not about to take over the government. I mean, uh, the mainstream parties, you know, the, the, the European People's Party is not going to get as many votes as last time, but still looks like being the largest party in the European Parliament. So it's worth putting it in context. But yes, there is an organisational challenge here in this country, partly because the two big parties are so internally divided about Brexit that they can barely bring themselves to come up with a position, which is very, very true of the Labour Party. Party. But also, if we look at the new Brexit party that Nigel Farage has la launched, he's chief executive and leader. They have the ability to do and say whatever they want on his whim, and that gives them an agility that the longer established parties are finding it very, very hard to deal with. And just a final question to, uh, to all of you, um, and then perhaps starting with you. Where do you think the EU has failed in the past few years? Because obviously we are seeing the surge. It's obvious that the institution isn't responding or isn't connecting uh, with the citizens. Where do you think it's failed? Well, I think one of the things the EU has always failed to do, I don't think this is new, is to attract the loyalty and sort of animate its public to come out and vote in large numbers at these elections. Turnout is always low in European Parliament elections. And one of the problems the EU has is when it comes to that, that connection between itself and its citizens, and that's still rather weak, I would say. Theophanes? Well, I think there are two issues there. One is the issue of identity. So the EU has failed to create a more European identity across all all 28 member states, and this is the result here that we've seen in, with Brexit, the, the distance that people feel from, from Europe. And the other thing is transnational solidarity. The fact that it hasn't been able to find the mechanisms to respond to problems that are happening in different parts of the EU with the appropriate means. And Stefano Vergine, very briefly, where do you think the EU has failed? I think mainly on, on coping with the economic crisis that started in 2008, uh, I'm saying this at least on the Italian side, the feeling among ordinary people is that the European Union was not able to help Italy and other countries such as Greece uh, during the economic crisis. And this is also a reason why uh, also within Lega there are people saying we should leave the Eurozone and go back to our, our old currency in order to be able to boost the economy. Stefano Vergine, we're going to have to leave it there. Stefano Vergine, Anna de Menon, Theophanis Exodactylos. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much thank for you. having shared your views with us.
So thanks to all our guests. And of course, thank you for having joined us. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. But for now, from me, Barbara Sarah and the whole team here, bye for now.